A Piff fam, what's good? Good morning to you. It's so good uh, to be gathered virtually uh, celebrating the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I personally woke up this morning really excited and ready to get into the word of God. Would you do me a favor and just let somebody know that we are live and that we are about to get into the Bible, get into the scriptures, uh, the the word of God. Uh, Do me a favor also and just let somebody know in the chat room that Psalm 119 verse 105 is in effect. And that is your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we are certainly looking for the Lord to illuminate the paths of our life. So grab your Bibles and get to the Old Testament. We are in the book of Esther. Esther is where we're going to hang out uh, this morning. Uh, As you guys are turning there yesterday, the fellas had a Zoom uh, call a, a debate on who the GOAT is, the greatest of all time. And so we argued Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Kobe Bryant. And I'm going to just be honest with y'all. I have never seen our guy so heated and emotionally connected. Gabe was trying to moderate the chat room. And several times he had to put Dave on mute. He, he had to put Garmin on mute several times. Ashton was representing real hard, representing Chicago. And Wendell was trying to lay out his, uh, his argument. And it was just a good time. And I think at the end of the call, two-hour call, we realized that LeBron James is the GOAT. Uh, all right, let's get to work. I know y'all are probably dragging me in the chat room right now. Uh, but it's all good. I stand by what I said. Uh, we're, we're in a sermon series, our second week in a sermon series. It is called Interruptions, How God Works All Things Together. Last week, we got to look at the life of Moses. And, and Moses is hiding out in Midian for 40 years. And the Lord had to come and interrupt him to get him on track, get him back to Egypt to do his assignment, which was to deliver uh, the Israel people out of Egypt and out of bondage. Uh, and this week, I think the same thing is going to happen. We're going to look at the life of a queen, Queen Esther. I, I need all of the queens in the chat room to throw up a crown emoji, to throw up the emoji with the lady with the crown or, or the one like this where you patting the hair. Throw that emoji up uh, so we can acknowledge your royal presence in the room. Uh, certainly, we will be digging in today uh, and looking at how God had to interrupt her life in order to put her on assignment, just like last week. Uh, We made a commitment over the next four weeks to go over four different biblical characters. And these four different biblical characters are all people that God had to divinely interrupt in order to align them with his will. And and, uh, I I told you that I wanted to look at four and today we're in week two of it. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I had to make a slight detour. Instead of four, we're going to look at three. And the reason we're going to look at three is because we're going to do Esther uh, part one this week. And then next week, we're going to do Esther part two, simply because it's so much in the book. In fact, I would encourage you this week to just read through the entire book in one sitting. I did it several times this week. It's 10 chapters long. Start in chapter one. It's probably going to take you about 30 minutes to just rock all the way through it. Uh, but I, I guarantee you, it's just one of those stories that will just ignite your affections for uh, the living God. And so uh, this week we are in Esther part one. In fact, let's just do it. I'm jumping right in. Pick me up in verse one of chapter two. Esther chapter two, uh, verse one. Scripture's coming up on the screen right now. It says, after these things, when the anger of King Ashurius, your your Bible might say Xerxes, King Xerxes had abated. He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all of the provinces of his kingdom to be gathered, to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women and let their cosmetics be given to them and let the young women who please the king be queen. Please note this instead of Vashti, this pleased the king. And he did so jump to verse 17 real quick. It says the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she won grace and favor in the sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head instead of queen, instead of, uh, and gave, I'm sorry, put the crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. I'm simply going to preach today from the topic entitled Interruptions, Esther part one. Look to the Lord with me as we dig in. Father, we are convinced that we need you. 
So Father, in this moment, as we dig into your word, as we unpack the nutrients of this passage and this story, this, that this historical story, Lord, I pray, oh God, that you would use it to put us back on track. I pray that this text would be the interruption that many of us have prayed for since last week. That this would be the text that you would speak directly to us and directly to our situation. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Interruptions, Esther part one. At the expense of uh, coming across very spiritually immature at the top of the sermon, would y'all do me a favor in the chat room? In the chat room right now, would you let me know what Netflix or Hulu special or series that you're watching right now? Did you start typing it in? Just fill it up, fill up the chat room. I'll give you a second. I'll pause here and give you a second to just put into the chat all of the Netflix and Hulu series that you're currently watching right now. I just finished up Ozark and... Ozark was a great one, man. It was three seasons long, and I certainly don't want to get right into another binge-watching series. However, I need recommendations, and so I'm, I'm literally looking at the chat right now and seeing what you're putting in. One of the things I found out about this season that we're in is one of the worst places to be in is between Netflix series. It's just a dark place. You're, you're in that place where you're trying to figure out what to watch and you're trying to click on different movies and you're looking at different movie trailers and you're trying to find something to watch because your regular rhythm of just clicking onto Netflix and clicking onto your show and clicking onto your series is over. You're in between. So I found myself in that season right now. But what I've done over the last several weeks since I stopped my last series, which was Ozark. What I've done is I've been watching a lot of older movies, older movies back at least a decade old. Benjamin Button, I got to put that on and check that out. I watched Salt. Y'all remember Angelina Jolie, Salt? I don't know why they didn't make a sequel. That was a great movie. Also got to watch a movie, Speed. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, Speed, with Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock. But in this movie, the plot of it is, is a great plot. It's this plot that they're on this bus and the bus is going above 50. And if they drop below 50, the bus has been rigged to blow up. If they unload the bus, it's going to blow up. And so the, butt, the bus is just moving and it's, it's on speed. And the, the whole movie is full of adrenaline and it's fast paced and it's moving. And you never get to slow down. It lives up to its name, Speed. But one of the things I realized when I watched that movie is I wonder if that's what our life looked like before the virus, before the shutdown, before the quarantine. The way Charlemagne will say it is, what did our life look like BC, before corona? What did our lives look like? It is typically in those moments where we are fast paced and we're moving and we're not stopping and, and, and we're just going and going and going. It's in those moments that if we're not careful, we can miss the very voice of God. So sometimes in those seasons, he has to slow us down so that we can hear his voice, so that we can get back on track to what he is calling us to do. And I think that's what's happening in the passage. Esther is about to get interrupted, but she's getting interrupted for a specific purpose. God has an assignment for Esther, and I think the assignment for Esther is going to be very consistent with what we're dealing with in our lives as we're going through the regular rhythms God usually has to come in and say, hold, hold, hold on, hold on. I got something for you. You're going off track. You're, you're, you're doing well in this season, but you got to get over here because this is where I want you. And I think that's what's going to happen in our passage. We come to a passage where a young lady is minding her own business. She's going through life. And it looks like the Lord just slows down and taps her on the shoulder. Now, context is key. Somebody type that in for me. Context is key. If you've been a part of our church for any amount of time, one of the things you'll notice about our church is that we are serious about context. We never parachute into a passage without at least understanding what was happening before and what's happening after because context is so important to understand the passage that you were in. So I wanna do two things really, really quickly. This is the foundation. This is why I had to do part one and part two. Don't y'all check out on your boy. I have to at least lay a foundation of context, but also do a little bit of character analysis. In other words, I have to, there are a lot of names in the book of Esther. I have to at least explain who a few of them are so that we can understand the passage. For first uh, name is in it, that, that you find in chapter two is King Xerxes. King Xerxes is the king of Persia. Don't get it twisted. He is the most powerful man in the world at this time. This book was written in 400 BC. Nobody was more powerful than the king of Persia. And at this time, King Xerxes is king. He has a wife, chapter one, says a 
young lady named Vashti. And here's a couple of things you need to know about Vashti. According to verse 11, she's beautiful. According to Michael Jackson, she's a PYT, a Persian young thing. She is drop dead gorgeous. The other person that's in the text is a young lady by the name of Esther. She is also beautiful, but here's what you need to know about her. She is a Jewish girl. And we get her name in the text as well. There's another guy. I won't deal too much with him this week. We'll talk about him next week. Mordecai. He's her uncle. He's an intricate part of this book. And so we'll talk about him next week. The other person we're going to talk about next week is a guy by the name of Haman. Haman is a hater, or the way they would say it today is he's a confused fan. He hates the Jews. And he hates the Jews really because of one person. He hates the Jews because of Mordecai. And he devises this plan. He comes up with this plan to annihilate all of the Jews. In fact, it's put into law. We'll talk about it next week. That's a little bit of character analysis. Don't y'all check out on me. Here's a little bit of context for you. Chapter one of this very book, you find that the Israelites, the, the Hebrew people are in exile under Persians, under the Persian law, under the Persian rule. Verse five of chapter one says that King Xerxes decides to throw this major party. You, you got to understand something about the Persian parties. The Bible says in chapter five that it lasted seven days. Can we agree that if you have a party that lasts for seven days, it's legit. Like if you start partying on a Saturday night and then your girl calls you on Thursday morning to have brunch and you like, girl, I'm still wobbling from last week. That's a party. So the Bible says in, in, in verse number five of chapter one, that King Xerxes throws a massive party that lasts for seven days. But don't just note the time frame of the party. Note the details given in chapter one. We won't preach through them, but the details in chapter one tells me that out of all the people there, nobody had the same cup. Everybody had different cups. And don't just notice the cups. What was in the cups was expensive wine. There, there was no drink limits. There, there was no alcohol limits. There was no breathalyzers. Everybody was lit for seven straight days. And on the seventh day, the king wanted to show how mighty he was and how powerful he was. And so he calls Queen Vashti into the party because he simply wants to parade her around. He wants to show her off like she's a trophy. Only problem with that is number one, Vashti ain't having that. You ain't going to just be prating me around this party. So she says no. The second reason she says no is check chapter, chapter one. She has her own party with her own friends going on. Can we agree that's a little dysfunctional for the marriage? Never throw separate parties on the same day. She has her own party going on. And so she tells the king, no, I cannot come to your party. No, you cannot parade me around. And the king is angered. Chapter one, the king is so angered that the Bible tells me he calls his friends together in the middle of the party and says, the queen just denied me. What should I do? Can we agree that if you've been drinking for seven straight days, probably not a good time to get marital advice. Probably not a good time to make long-term decisions on that marriage. They've been drinking and drinking. The king's been drinking and he calls his friends and says, what should I do? And they say, you know what, king, there's, there's really two things that you have to do. Number one, you have to um, let all of the women in Persia know that this is not acceptable. He says, because our wives just watched your wife disrespect you. So when I get home, just stay with me, this is context. When I get home, my wife will in turn then disrespect me. And so here's what you got to do, King. You got to make a rule that every Persian wife should submit to her husband and her husband should rule over here. You want to talk about gender inequality laws? They literally in Persia put a law in place that hindered women from being able to operate as though God had created them. Here's what I know, and I'll spend just a few seconds on this. You know, a lot of times when we look at the laws that are created in our nation, we think that it's something new. But you got to understand that laws that limited ladies and laws that push uh, systemic racism are not new. They happened in Persia in 400 BC. But here's what I love about God. Whenever uh, humans create laws, systemic laws that cause people to be oppressed, God always raises up his people 
to speak to the law. God always raises up his people to go against the law. And you go, uh-uh, Pastor B, not today. You ain't going to be getting political today. You ain't going to be talking about politics. Just preach the gospel. But what do you do with the book of Esther? Because the entire book of Esther is how the queen went against two laws. One law was against women, and the other law was against the annihilation of a people group, an entire race. And here's why I'm so passionate to make sure that you and I as believers are participating and doing justice. As Micah 6, 8 will say, we can't sit by the sidelines and wait for the politicians to handle this. The church got to raise up. Why? Because Esther raises up to go against two laws. As believers, we have to do that. Jim Crow laws, segregation laws, voter suppression laws, stop and frisk, stand your ground. Any law that allows you to hunt a young man as he is jogging and kill him and walk free, any law that allows that must be challenged by you and I, those of us who have trusted in Jesus. So God is going to raise up a young lady to challenge the very laws of Persia. And it's something so interesting about how she does it. So here's the first thing that happens. The friends say, listen, you got to ban these, these women from these Persian women from acting crazy because they just saw your wife. So that's, that's law number one. Here's the second thing you got to do, King. Vashti can never come back in your presence. She's banned. You, you got to get rid of her. She can never do that again. And so, in fact, don't just get rid of her. Get a new queen. And here we are in chapter Two. Thank you for hanging out with me for the context. Chapter two is finally where we get to see Esther interrupted because of everything that happened in chapter one. Now we get to see what it looks like for God to tap this young lady on her shoulder and say, I got an assignment for you. I got three points and I will not be on them long. Three points and then I'll let you go. It's kind of a, a teaser to set us up for next week. Point one. Hope you're writing these down. If you're not, they're going to come up on the screen. Point one about interruptions. Interruptions are often presented first as obstacles. We're going to see that in in the text. Point two that we'll deal with. The first response when being interrupted is preparation. Point three, interruptions should cause you to look more like Jesus. That's the three points that we got. Y'all hang out with me for a little bit longer. Again, you still got time to let somebody know that we are live and we're in the word and we're about to go through three points of interruption. All right, point one. Interruptions are often presented first as obstacles. Watch the text here. Verse number one, of chapter two. It says, after these things, when the anger of King Assurius had abated, he remembered... Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, let beautiful virgins be sought out for the king. Verse 17 will say, the king loved Esther more than all the women and she won grace and favor in the sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So in other words, what happens is, Now that uh, the first queen denied the king, he gets a beauty pageant in chapter two. He gets all these young, beautiful virgins together. And out of all of them, verse 17 says that he picks Esther. Now, now when we read that, we don't realize how big of a deal that is. You want to talk about interruptions being first as obstacles. This is a major obstacle for her to be queen. In order for her to be queen, there are several things that has to happen. Number one, The first obstacle for her being queen, she's a Jew. You got to understand something about Persian kings. Persian kings only picked wives from a few notable families. But here you have a young Jewish girl rising to the ranks to be the most powerful woman in Persia. Don't miss it. And she's a Jew. That's a major obstacle in order for her to be queen. She shouldn't be queen. Second obstacle, she's a slave. Remember, I told you that the Persians now have conquered over Israel. She is a slave in Persia. Slaves didn't become queens. It's a major obstacle in order for her to be a queen. The third and final one is she's an orphan. 
You got to understand something. Orphans had no money. She had no parents. She had no political clout. She had nobody to teach her how to be a good a wife, how to be a good leader, how to be a good woman of God. And here through all of this, God's interruptions caused a woman in the lowest socioeconomic class to be raised up to be the most powerful woman in Persia. And God did that through an interruption. You should type that in. God works through interruptions, even through obstacles. All of the obstacles that were against her, when it looked like it was impossible, when it looked like the odds were stacked against her, God said, this is the right time for me to step in. And the reason he does that is because he wants everybody around you to know that when you get on, when you get put on, that it was only God that could do it. The Bible says, that the interruption here happened through an obstacle. Why are we surprised when God calls us to do something and the first thing you're met with is opposition? Why are we surprised when God calls us and puts us on purpose and puts us on an assignment? Why are we surprised that we are receiving pushback? We shouldn't, we shouldn't receive, we shouldn't receive, uh, we shouldn't feel like we are, we're not going to receive uh, any pushback. We should know that this is actually a really good opportunity for me to trust God. You should type that in the chat. Obstacles are good opportunities to trust God. Let me say that again. Obstacles are good opportunities to trust God. When an obstacle is faced before you, that is an opportunity to just trust in God because God says stuff like in Genesis 18, verse 14, he says stuff like, is there anything too hard for me? Let me answer that for you. No, there is nothing too hard for God. But what happens is God interrupts us, puts us on assignment. We see the obstacles and we give up because we think it's not God, but it is your, your, your interruption is packaged as an obstacle. God always works. He never just allows you to just walk through the door. Sometimes he has to put a little option, uh, uh, a little opposition there so that you can understand that it is God that is going to keep you. Is there anything too hard for me? No, nothing's too hard for me. So here's what I'm saying. Don't allow the obstacle to throw you off. Don't allow the obstacle to detour you. Don't allow the obstacle to confuse you. Don't allow the obstacle to make you give up and throw your hands up. It is an opportunity to trust God. Someone tapped in today. You've been receiving a lot of pushback on your journey. You, you, you've been receiving a lot of opposition, but here's what I came on to tell you. Go back and try it again. Go, go ahead and apply for that job again. Go ahead and ask for that, uh, for that raise again. Keep pressing through it because it is through the obstacles that we get to learn real dependency and trust on God. Jeremiah 17, blesses the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. I, I love the song that says, nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe you brought me this far to leave me. It might not be easy and you might got to work through some stuff, but it is through the obstacles that we get to learn what trust is. I mean, I'll never forget when we first planted the church or we first had a desire to plant the church. Part of my training, Dr. Mason said, man, here's some things that you got to do. You got to learn how to raise some money for the church. You got to raise support. Why do you have to do that? Because when you first start a church, you don't have anybody. You, you don't have anybody supporting the church. So therefore, you got to raise money. So what I did was I went around the country. I mean, I was on and off planes talking to churches on partnering with us, giving them vision, giving them our core conviction, telling them about our church. And the reason I was doing that is because I needed them for a season to just help us financially. And you, will, you won't believe how many people said, this is great. This is nice, but we can't help you. And sometimes those no's will detour you. Sometimes those no's will make you think that it's not God. Sometimes it is the no that will make you give up, but don't allow it to make you give up. Interruptions are always packaged as obstacles. Please type that in the chat room. It's always packaged. Interruptions are always packaged as obstacles. This week, this is what I want you to do. I hope y'all y'all rocking with me here. This week, I want you to take a real piece of paper, not your phone, not your notes, not an email. Take a physical piece of paper, take a pen or a pencil, and I just want you to write out all of the hindrances in your life. All of the obstacles, just write them all out. And at the end of it, I want you to put it on top of the paper, Genesis 18, 14, is there anything too hard for God? Let that encourage you. Don't let that obstacle stop you. Let it encourage you that I can work through 
the obstacles. Point one, interruptions are often presented first as an obstacle. Point two, the first step in being interrupted is preparation. Here's our biggest problem when we read the Bible. The biggest problem that you and I can have if we're not careful when reading the Bible is we think that the events of the Bible occurred at the same speed in which we read them. Told you this week I read all 10 chapters. It took me about 30 minutes to do so. You can read chapter one and chapter two in maybe about two or three minutes. And sometimes when we read the Bible that quick, we think that all of the events happen that quick. And so we could think that Esther rose to the rank of being queen like that. But the reality is it took her some time what did she do in getting called and actually doing the work? Here's what she did. One word, prepared. That's what she did. Okay, let, let me do it this way. Chapter one, verse three, the Bible says that King Xerxes, it was the third year of his reign. If you go to chapter two, verse 16, it says that it was the seventh year of his reign. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I do know that three minus seven is four. So don't miss this. In between chapter one and chapter two is a four year period. What did Esther do for four years? We didn't read it, but if you read through the rest of chapter two, she prepared. The Bible tells me that cosmetics were brought to her, oil was brought to her, myrrh was brought to her, spices and ointments were brought to her. She was put on a special diet. She prepared for four years. Four years is a long time to have spa treatments. Four years of exfoliation. Four, four years of manicures. Four years of going to Udit and Angela to get on a specific skin regimen. Four years of preparation. Before she met the king, she spent four years preparing. And here's the reality. Many of us like the idea of God interrupting us. Sometimes if we're not careful, we don't like the idea of first preparing. Because whenever God calls you, he always calls you first to be equipped. He always calls you first to prepare. He never just calls you. You never move right to the palace. You always move to preparation first. That, that'll preach. Type that in for me. I want to see that in the chat room. Preparation comes before the palace. Let me say it over here. Preparation comes before the palace. Before she sat on the royal throne, she spent four years preparing. Shout out to all the young ladies that, and all the young men that are going back to school. This is the season to do that. Shout out to y'all that are taking online classes. Shout out to all of y'all that are doing internships and you're raising money so that you can do free internships just because you need that resume to be more solid. Shout out to you if you're developing your skills and you're preparing and you're practicing. You're not allowing this season to make you just sit home and do nothing, but this is the season of preparation. Shout out to you. Why am I saying that? Because a calling and an interruption is always first to prepare. God is calling some of you guys. See, you, you think you're ready for the palace. Sometimes he calls us first to just be in preparation and equipment. My wife's grandmother taught me how to make potato salad. And one, one of the things I, I learned by sitting in the kitchen and watching her make potato salad is the secret to her potato salad. No, she don't make potato salad. She make potato salad. T-A-T-A, -A, tater salad. She, she makes it to where, you know, potato salad got to be a little yellow. It can't just be a, it got to be a little yellow. And she showed me how she made uh, potato salad, but I realized that the key for her potato salad was preparation. See, when we got in the kitchen, I was like, man, let's stir that thing up. The, the food is all ready. Let's just stir that thing up and get, she said, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. You got to first prepare. She skinned those onions. She the, she boiled the potatoes, skinned the potatoes, chopped up the onions. She boiled the eggs, took the sweet pickle mix and all of her seasonings. And she got everything, like mayonnaise and mustard, she sugar. She got everything all laid out and all prepared. And she said, this is the, this is the part that makes the potato salad better is when you've spent time preparing. Don't rush the process. And a lot of times we feel like preparation is wasted time, but preparation is not wasted time. You are not wasting time because you are preparing. You're actually being a good steward over the next season. Preach. That a, preach right there that you are, you are in the next season. You will be better off when you spend time in this season preparing and getting yourself 
ready and getting yourself together. It is Abraham Lincoln that said, if you ask me to chop down a tree in six hours, I'm going to spend the first four sharpening the axe. Where are the axe sharpeners? Where are the people that are saying, you know what? I'm ready to chop down a tree, but I got to get the tools sharp first. I got to get myself ready first. Some of us have to develop in our character before God can use us. And so what happens is when God calls us, he first calls us to preparation. And you might be going, yo, Esther, that's real vain. That's real vain that you got all this cosmetic stuff going on for four years, but watch how God uses it. I don't want to dip into next week. Watch how God uses her beauty in order to get her an audience with the king. Watch how God does that thing next week. And so the first step in being interrupted is first preparation. Point one was interruptions are first presented as obstacles. She's a Jew, she's a slave, she's an orphan, but she rises to be the queen of Persia. Only God can do something like that. Final point, point three, interruptions should cause you to look more like Jesus. Esther is not elevated to be queen, to walk around the palace and be cute. That that's not why she's elevated. Yes, the Lord used her beauty to get her in the door, but the reason she's elevated to be queen is to protect her people, the Jewish people, from annihilation. She doesn't know that. She doesn't know the plans of God. God only gave her a little bit, but she doesn't know that that is what God is going to use in order to, uh, in order to save his people. He stops them from annihilation, and he does that through Queen Esther. And it is Queen Esther's position as a queen that now gets me to look at her and see Jesus. You got to understand that when she's elevated, when she's interrupted to be on assignment, she looks more like Jesus during that time because she uses her royal position in order to save her people. And she says stuff in chapter four. I ain't got time. I'll preach it next week. But she says stuff in chapter four, like if I perish, let me perish. She was willing to die for her people. I know another king that had a royal position that wasn't only willing to die for his people, but dies for his people. Just like Esther had to be lifted up and raised up on behalf of her people. So it is with Jesus Christ on the cross that was raised up for his people. Just like Esther had to experience extreme poverty, so it is with Jesus on the cross when he experienced poverty. Here's what the Bible says. And we put Bible here, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Though he was rich, yet he became poor for our sake. Just like Esther found favor with the king, so it is Jesus that found favor with his father. Just like Esther said, let me perish, it is Jesus that doesn't say it, but actually does perish so that his people will never, ever perish. You got to understand something about Esther. She looks more like Jesus because of the interruption. Here's my question. If God has interrupted you and put you on assignment, have you put him on the back burner? Do you got him sitting in one of those couches behind me and you've taken center stage? Is that the position that we take when we get interrupted? No, we should look more like Jesus. When God calls you to something, that is not a time for you, for you to detour your representation of who Jesus is. No, it's a time for you to floss off who he is on whatever platform it is that God has given you. She looks more like Jesus because of the interruption. Here, here's a question for you. S since you've been interrupted, if you have been, and you feel like you're really on purpose and you're really on assignment, who around you has gotten saved because of your presence? Who around you is being pursued because of your presence? Who around you has gotten gospel nutrients because of your presence? When I look at Esther, I get to see Jesus. She's the only queen that you look at. And you get to see Jesus smeared all over her life that she uses her royal position in order to save a people from being annihilated. Listen, Disney and Pixar, they've made some great movies, great movies. But let me tell you something about their princesses and their queens. Jasmine, Cinderella, Snow White, none of them can hold a candle to Queen Esther because Queen Esther points me to Jesus. Who in this live right now needs to be interrupted, but first you need to prepare. 
Who is it that's tapped into this live and you need to be interrupted and you need to understand that the obstacle is actually an opportunity? Who is it right now that's piped into this live that needs to hear me say that it is through the interruption that we look more like Jesus? Please don't. I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger here. Don't, don't, Don't pipe out. Next week, we will work harder at looking at what happens now that she is queen. So today, we just looked at what it looks like for her to be interrupted to be queen. Next week, we'll look at what God does now that she's in position. Let me pray for you. Every head bow. Father, I thank you, oh God, for everybody that's piped in. I I don't know where people are. I I don't know what they have going on in their life, but somebody is in the midst of hardship and struggle and they think that it is the hardship that is stopping them and making them go left. But Father, help them, give them endurance. Help them to press through. Help them to keep making their way. Father, I don't, I don't know who it is that's on this call that, that they're in the midst of a season of preparation. And, and this COVID-19 has felt like it's throwing them off. Father, would you give them creative ways to continue to prepare for the next season? Help us, Lord, to not get into that next season unprepared, but let us spend the time now preparing for your will. Father, I pray, oh God, my last prayer is that you would make all of us that have trusted in you look more like you. I pray that this week we would be better representations of who you are than we were last week. Would you use our positions and our platforms to to give out gospel influence so that people can know and see you. When people look at us, may they see you. When people hear us, may they hear you. When people experience our love and our compassion and our empathy, may they see you. So, Father, we thank you for the interruptions of life. Just pray, oh God, that this sermon series would do something in the lives of your people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, man, it was good hanging out with y'all. Listen, if this is the first service, after the second service, we will be doing next 15. If this is the second service, get off this. Get onto the Zoom link that's popping up right now in the chat room. Get onto the Zoom link because we're going to hang out for 15 minutes and just chill. Just talk. Do that lobby experience on your way out. If you're in the 130 service, you've missed it. Check us out in two weeks. That's when we'll be doing our next 15 again. Well, until next time, let me give you this blessing that's pronounced in Numbers chapter 6. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Grace and peace. I love y'all. Epiph, I miss y'all. Love y'all.